Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Robert Litvak. I'd like to welcome you all to the Woodrow Wilson Center for another meeting in our ongoing series on terrorism and homeland security issues that the center co-sponsors with Georgetown University Center for Peace uh, and Security Studies. Um, welcome to all of you. Uh, I'm delighted that uh, you could join us here today for what I think is a real uh, special opportunity to hear from Spain's leading counterterrorism expert um, on the fifth anniversary of the um, Madrid uh, bombings. Let me now turn the floor over to the co-chair of this series, Professor Bruce Hoffman, uh, a senior scholar at the Wilson Center, but also professor at Georgetown University, who will introduce our, our speaker and also uh, uh, tee up today's topic. Great. Thank you, Rob. Thank you all for coming, especially on such a uh, rainy, dreary day. It's really a great pleasure for me to welcome again to the Woodrow Wilson Center and to introduce uh, one of my oldest friends, uh, Professor Fernando Renares. Uh, professor Renares is currently Professor of Political Science and Security Studies at King Juan Carlos University in Madrid. He's also a senior analyst on international terrorism at the Alcano Royale Institute for International and Strategic Studies, also in Madrid. Um, he's had visiting appointments at Oxford University, uh, uh, pr previous permanent appointment at the University of Burgos in Spain. Um, I think, though, that what Professor Renares is, is best known for are really some of the seminal books on terrorism. Uh, certainly the central work on the Basque separatist group ETA, uh, titled Patriots of Death, Who Joined ETA and Why, uh, which was a compilation of several years of interviews with ETAristas or with ETA activists. Um, he's also the, the author of a very important general work on terrorism, Terrorism and Anti-Terrorism. Uh, the, uh, the editor of another important work published in English, European Democracies, Against, European Democracies Against Terrorism. And among the other things that Professor Renares is renowned for is that shortly before the March 2004 Madrid bombings, he argued about, the, unfortunately, the deaf ears, the danger of jihadi terrorism coming to Spain and was one of the most perspective and perspicacious analysts of the phenomena. This, in turn, won him a two-year appointment as senior advisor on anti-terrorist policy to the Minister of uh, the Interior, which he held between 2004 and 2006 before returning to university life. So welcome very much, Fernando, and thank you for coming. Thank you very much indeed, Bruce. It is a real pleasure, a privilege, and an honor for me to be here today. Uh, to make a presentation uh, within this uh, Georgetown University Wilson Center series. And uh, in particular, I'm uh, deeply grateful to uh, Robert Litwak and my longtime friend and, and, and one of the scholars uh, I admire most, um, um, Bruce Hoffman. Do let me start by uh, remembering some of the facts um, on March 11th. Um, it was March 11th, 2004, early hours in the morning, around 7.40. 13 bombs were placed in four commuting trains uh, on the railway line between uh, a town nearby Madrid Alcalá de Henares and Madrid City Center, a Atocha Station in particular. 10 of those 13 bombs actually exploded. Um, almost simu simultaneously. Then we also had uh, um, uh, th three bombs uh, which were recovered, a material crucial for the police investigation uh, to unveil uh, what happened. 191 people killed, um, well over 1,700 injured. This could have been worse if at least one of the trains um, would have exploded inside the Atocha station, but, but the train was two minutes in delay. Uh, that saved uh, probably two to 300 lives. Of course, we can refer to important material 
uh, damages, also very serious social and political consequences in Madrid, in Spain, not only because the Spanish society became deeply divided uh, over the legislature, the four year period following uh, the attacks, divided as to whom it was to be blamed for the attacks. Uh, might be surprising to many of you, but some Spaniards think that uh, Aznar was the responsible, ultimately. Some others uh, still believe today that ETA was behind the attacks. Uh, we, 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 we still have people thinking that the Moroccan intelligence service uh, was involved in what happened, and so on and so forth. And of course, conspiracy theories, com including a combination of these elements. We had um, a tremendous political debate in my country, outside my country as well, on the uh, impact of 3.11 on politics and policy, in particular on elections. As you all remember, elections took place only three days after the, the blast. Um, and um, a debate on whether or not the blast um, were determinant in the decision to withdraw Spanish troops from Iraq. This is not the focus of my presentation today, but I will be happy to uh, uh, discuss uh, and uh, answer uh, any, any question or comment uh, on this respect. Do let me remem remind you also that this was not an isolated incident. We commonly refer to 311, but this was not an isolated incident. The same terrorist attempted to attack a high-speed train on the uh, line between Madrid and Seville on April the third, uh, on April the second. Um, excuse me, on April the second. On April the third, we had uh, the suicide episode in Leganes, uh, which is uh, a locality um, just a few kilometers away from Madrid where they, they, they had this flat um, being used as a safe house. But uh, in this particular incident, uh, a policeman was killed. But also, uh, it's important to stress that um, all this was part of a series of attacks uh, expected to take place in the, in the uh, following weeks and perhaps months. How do, we, how do we know this? First of all, because the terrorists <coughs> already were accumulated information about the potential targets. We have that information on potential targets in and around Madrid uh, from, uh, uh, from uh, a school uh, in Madrid to um, a U.S. Uh, recreation center um, in one of the provinces surrounding Madrid. We also know that the terrorists rented a, a, another house um, in Granada, um, uh, probably uh, as a base, to be used as a base for operations in that area of tremendous symbolism. <coughs> they, they were storing explosives and weapons. We had, it is often, it is often said, that um, the Leganes suicide was a reaction against the police surrounding the terrorists. But we have testament letters from individuals belonging to the Madrid network, written well before uh, uh, 3.11. So uh, to perpetrate a, a suicide attack was in their plans, although 3.11 wasn't a suicide attack. Um, and what about the financial reservoir? They had, they had 1 million 500 euros. 1 million 500 euros. The actual cost of the attacks, uh, 311 attacks, was um, no less than 105,000 euros. Now, 311. Uh, has been subject 
to uh, different interpretations. And often, the Madrid bombings are held, are considered as a prototypical example of an independent local cell at work. The perpetrators of the Madrid bombings are often considered an example of self-recruited leaderless jihad, a bunch of guys in a world. Al-Qaeda was nothing than inspirational, and the motivations behind the Iraq war. The media worldwide has contributed to this idea, Su surprisingly, and I will say astonishingly. Um, five years after the Madrid bombings, I still read, um, I still had to read in Le Monde, um, uh, an article where the journalists say the sentence made it clear. It was a local independent cell. Well, the sentence nowhere says so. Nowhere says so. The sentence says the individuals involved in the plot were members of, of cells and groups of jihadist orientation. Al-Qaeda has referred several times the Moroccan Islamic combatant group dozens of times throughout the sentence. My conclusion is with respect to this particular journalist that he didn't read the sentence. Moreover, at a more analytical level, the Madrid train bombings are <coughs> sometimes, or I could say often as well, presented as an illustration of the extent to which, it is said, Al-Qaeda-related terrorism became an amorphous phenomenon after 9-11 and the loss of sanctuary in Afghanistan. Well, I think, I think that, we, that we have to be a bit more cautious in taking for granted uh, this vision of what happened on, on, on 3-11 in uh, Spain um, on the basis of facts unveiled by police investigation, judicial investigation, um, mm, also um, academic research. What, what are my sources? Um, I have been quite restrictive in this sense. I will, I will only refer to data and information which is in the summary, in the 311 judicial summary, in the sentences of both the National Court and the High uh, Supreme Court in Spain, <coughs> in the three sentences we have, one in Italy and two in Morocco, on the Madrid bombings, um, and also on, on all the reports um, written by the Public Prosecutor's Office uh, at the National Court in this particular case. So taking these sources, uh, my proposal is to adopt an individual level of analysis and, um, uh, uh, and, uh, and assess the accuracy of uh, the vision of the Madrid bombings as an independent local cell at work. But uh, adopting an individual level of analysis uh, requires to, to answer uh, a very simple question. How many individuals to include? I have been very restrictive in, in this particular say, uh, in respect to, because although, although the police investigation has relevant information on around 100 individuals directly or indirectly considered involved in the bombings, I will only, only refer to 27 individuals. Why? 
13 of them convicted by the National Court and the Supreme Court in Spain. So I'm excluding non-terrorist criminals such as you know the, 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 uh, those individuals dealing illegally with explosives in Spain uh, or um, individuals in general um, who were not members of the terrorist network as such. Two more convicted for the Madrid bombings in Saleh in Morocco recently. One more convicted on a summary about the Madrid bombings and related events in Milano. The seven individuals who um, committed suicide in Leganes on April the 3rd, and four known individuals um, who escaped um, uh, and are, uh, uh, became fugitives, and some of them uh, ended up uh, killing themselves in Iraq. But fugitives, but uh, related to the Madrid bombing. That makes a total of 27, as, as I say, if I apply this very restrictive um, uh, criteria. Now, all of them are males born between 1960 and 1983. The half of those who are born between 1970 and 1979, aged between 20 and 43 at the, t at the time of the bombings. The majority, however, were between 24 and 33 when the attacks took place. 22 Moroccans, so the vast majority, two Algerians, one Tunisian, one Egyptian, one Lebanese. First generation immigrants in Spain and other European countries, so no second third generation, not really home ground terrorism the way we used to think about this phenomenon. This is uh, in contrast with the, with the July 7th uh, case, for instance. And very diverse as to family background, marital status, level of education, uh, to tends to be um, low, uh, but still we have four individuals who had um, a university or college level education. Mm. Now, taking all those 27 individuals convicted or suicided or fugitives with respect to the Madrid bombings. The very first thing that will surprise us is to find out that among them, we have three individuals, two of them playing key roles in the Madrid bombings, actually Sarhane Ben Abdel Majid Faket and Jamal Sugan. Sahane was the, the, the organizer of the, uh, of the uh, Madrid network, and Jamal Sugan was the ringleader of the bombers, who were members of the Al-Qaeda cell established in Spain in the 90s. Also, Said Barrach was a member of the Abu Dada cell. It is also known as the Abu Dada cell established in the 90s. All of them were under, unfortunately, under investigation by the police because of their links and membership to the Al-Qaeda. This, this is why um, it took just a few days for the police to <coughs> identify these particular individuals. They were all um, under investigation by Judge Baltasar Garzón in the judicial summary on the Abu Dhabi cell. Said Barak was also uh, a man with uh, experience in Afghanistan, uh, a real um, relevant member of this cell. So the, all, all, all these three individuals were known to the police since the 90s. Perhaps I should remember you how important 
the uh, Al Qaeda cell in Spain was. It was founded by Abu Musa al Suri, Mustafa said Marian, an individual who in 1996 was inside Osama bin Laden's inner circle, who after founding the Al Qaeda cell in Spain left the country in 1995 to join Abu Qutada in London and take charge of the GIA magazine. Not surprisingly, the GIA uh, split it into, uh, into two factions, and the GSPC arising in 1998. It was when Abu Musab al-Suri left, it was um, Imad Eddin Barakat Jarkas, that is to say Abu Dada, who took the lead in the cell. That cell, that cell had um, extensive international connections with other European countries, with the Middle East, with Southeast Asia, we were financing a, a training camp there, uh, with Bosnia in particular, uh, but also with the Hamburg cell. And this is the reason why this <coughs> Spanish Al-Qaeda cell was dismantled in October, November 2001, after evidence was brought uh, on the linkages between uh, Abu Dada and Mohammed Atta and the exchanges they had. Uh, still, many, many of my countrymen, many of my students, for instance, uh, still are surprised to know that Mohammed Atta, weeks before 9-11, 9-11, weeks before 9-11, was in Spain having a meeting in a hotel uh, in, a, in a coastal Catalonian town, um, um, Salou, Ramshi bin Albish, before, before he, he went back to Pakistan, traveled to Spain to obtain false documents who allowed him to, to reach Pakistan again through uh, Turkey. Um, so this Al-Qaeda cell in Spain in the 90s was was the other important one together with the Hamburg cell um, um, in, uh, in the Al-Qaeda structure in those days. Now we still have a fourth individual whose name is Aleke Malamari. Aleke Malamari. This, uh, this individual, he was a member of the Buddha Dada cell. He was a member, of, uh, but this indirectly related to the Buddha Dada cell because he was a member of the GIA, of a GIA cell established in Spain, in Valencia, in the city of Valencia, whose leader was in contact with Abu Dada. Now, Alekim Alamari was, Alekim Alamari was one of the seven suiciders in Leganes. A wannabe, Alekim Alamari was arrested in Spain in 1997 for terrorist activities related to the GIA, and by error released from prison in 2002. Still, in the, in the summary, in the judicial summary, we have this note um, from the National Intelligence Center in Spain saying that this individual was, as from 2002, as when uh, he left the prison, uh, was telling his closest ones, how strongly he wanted to perpetrate a major attack in Spain against all those governments, society, prosecuting Muslims like him, and so on and so forth. Uh, the note, um, unfortunately, le uh, left that note at home. But the, the note ends up saying, he knows very well the cities of Alcalá de Henares, Valencia, and Madrid. Amazing. Remember I told you that the train was traveling from Alcalá to Madrid. Alekima Lamari. Well, neither Sarhane Ben Abdelmajid Thaket, <coughs> nor Jamal Sugam, nor Said Barraj, nor Alekima Lamari are individuals we can characterize as belonging to a local independent cell. Even less so 
self-radicalized, self-recruited individuals. And they all play the fun fundamental roles in the uh, operational in the Madrid side. Secondly, among those 27, 27 individuals, we also have two notorious members of the Moroccan Islamic combatant group, Hassan al-Haski and Youssef Belhad. Hassan al-Haski is, is not a notorious member, actually. He was a leading member in those days competing for leadership uh, within the Moroccan Islamic combatant group structures in Europe. Youssef Belhada is not only a prominent Moroccan Islamic combatant group, but the sentence, the judge in the sentence says, um, a relevant member of the Al-Qaeda network in Europe. Why, that, why is it that the judge says so and not a, a relevant member of the Moroccan Islamic combatant group only? Because we have a number of indications to conclude that he had dual membership. Um, we have a, 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 a non-protected um, witness who uh, told both the police and the judges that, uh, that he heard his uncle, Josep Bella, um, um, about his membership uh, <coughs> in Al-Qaeda. But we also have to remember that he is the man, Abu Dujan. He is the man, Abu Dujan, and not Abu Dujana. I will explain where the difference lies. It's not exactly the same. Uh, it's Abu Dujan. Um, um, he, he used to refer himself as Abu Dujana al-Afghani uh, and signed it as such the, the second communique issued after the Madrid bombings um, where Abu Dujana al-Afghani styles himself as the spokesman for the military branch of Ansar al-Qaeda in Europe. Youssef Beldag was back and forth between Brussels, where he lived, where he lived, and Madrid. His last trip to Madrid was made in February 2004, and he left Madrid three days before 3.11. He was coming to Madrid to meet his followers who were part of the network. As I said, three days before, he took uh, a Virgin Express flight from Madrid back to Brussels, departing at 20.35. All this documentation has been, um, uh, is conclusive and is part of the summary. Now, if, if someone will ever ask me, what is the m single most interesting or remarkable or, or, or fascinating uh, fact with respect to the Madrid bombings, I will always reply the same. Something related to Youssef Beldag. Why? Because, because when the Belgian police, when the Belgian police enter his apartment in a, uh, in a neighborhood in Brussels, in his room, the police found two cellular phones. Uh, one of those phones uh, operated with a prepaid card that someone acquired, acquired uh, purchase on October 19, 2003. October 19, 2003. So the day after, the day, ap the day after, I'm gonna tell you later on, the day after what? <laughs> October 19, 2003, that prepaid car inside one of the two cellular phones in the room 
of Josef Beldag in Brussels and not in Madrid. Um, was acquired actually providing a false identity, a false name, a false address, and a false birth date. The birth date was 11 March 1921. 11 March 1921. This was, again, in October 19, 2003, intensely because not even the Spanish elections were called in that day. The Spanish elections were called in January 2004. The Shura 21 of the Quran is the Shura where you have these passages reflect, ref, uh, referring to how the infidels will have, to, will have to take out the fire from their faces and their backs. But this is just an interpretation. Hmm? Uh, uh, the rest of the information is not only in the summary, but also in the sentence. The judge in Spain concluded that, yes, it is true that the phone was in his room. It is true that, the, that the, the, this date was falsely provided as per day, but it can really not be proved that Josep Bilda himself bought the prepaid car. But obviously, judicial truth is not always the same as uh, uh, analytical um, um, or academic analysis. Hmm. Interestingly, I, I remember I mentioned a second phone. Well, the second cellular phone was um, included a, a, a prepaid car which is shortly after the other one. And again, the person who, I can't even say myself, but it was Josep Bela. What I can say is that Josep Bela had those phones. He was using those phones, and they were in his room in Brussels. The second was acquired, as I say, using a false identity, and this time, uh, the name is not important, the address is not important, but this time the birthday provided was May 16, 1985. I can't really uh, interpret 1985, but May 16th is the date of the Casablanca attacks. I'm only talking about proven facts. Interestingly, the Madrid network and the Casablanca network overlap partially. Hassan al Haski has been condemned in the Madrid bombings and in the Casablanca bombings. Mustafa Maimouni, convicted for the Casablanca bombings, was the man who started all the Madrid network until the day he traveled to Morocco in April 2003, was arrested there, and then who took the lead of the Madrid um, local network, Sir Hamed Ben Abdel Majid Zahed. Three days, three, uh, 13, excuse me, 13 days before 3.11, 13 days before 3.11, say that, 13 days before 3.11, Judge Baltasar Garzón at the National Court in Madrid approved a request from the Moroccan authorities to tape conversations of two individuals that the Moroccan authorities consider very, very close to the Casablanca network. The names of those two individuals requested from the Moroccan authorities to be followed and taped were Sahane Ben Abdel Majid Fahed and Jamal Sugam. I, I shouldn't go into details on, on what the role of the Moroccan Islamic combatant group um, has been after Al-Qaeda and affiliated groups lost sanctuary in Afghanistan. Perhaps reading uh, 
Rowan Gunnar Almina and Nielsen uh, article in a recent issue of Studies in Conflict and Terrorism will survive for the moment. But perhaps I should uh, remember something that Rowan uh, includes not in his article, but is in the 311 summary, a uh, very well known fact in Morocco. And this is an intelligence report. Um, the judges asked the, the, the police intelligence to provide. Now, the intelligence report says that in February 2002, there was a meeting in Istanbul. Members or delegates from the Moroccan Islamic Combatant Group, the Libyan Islamic Fighting Group, and the Tunisian Combatant Group attended the meeting. Among other things, they decided 2002, this is February 2002, and everyone was trying to relocate, and, and, and a new strategy was to be adopted. Among other things, they decided, the intelligence report says, to carry out acts of jihad, uh, not only in conflict zones, but also there where members live or there where members come from. February 2002, Istanbul. May 2003, Casablanca. March 2004, Madrid. Said Barrach took part in the meeting in Istanbul. Said Barrach, remember I, I already mentioned, I didn't say he was crucial in the, in the uh, he, uh, he played a key, a key role as organizing, uh, he, uh, he was strongly important as member of the. So we have here a, a strategic decision by organizations of, of, of North Africa and of Maghreb origin, Maghreb origin to be more precise. And why is it that the, the, the Algerians were, were here? The Algerians, why they should be here? They, they had their own facilities, camps, and activity in Algeria. I, it's not that they, they lost um, something. Here in, the, in, in Istanbul, um, we had those organizations, those Maghrebi organizations, uh, actually in need of redefining their, their place and the strategy. Well, this, interestingly, this idea uh, um, agreed upon in Istanbul in 2002 was um, uh, a recurrent idea put forward by several individuals, among them Mohamed Larbi Ben Seyab, in, in the meetings, the Madrid network, or members of different groupings of the Madrid network had as uh, from 2002, as from 2002. It is also important to remember that those who escape, or at least those four, known um, Madrid network members who escaped and ended up in Iraq did so using the Moroccan Islamic Combatant Group uh, networks in, in Europe, in addition to the Ansar al-Islam, Ansar al-Zuna uh, networks in, in the Middle East. And finally, I should perhaps, among other things, uh, call your attention on the fact that the, 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 the 311 summary contains um, uh, a police intelligence report uh, explaining how um, the training facility headed by the Moroccan Islamic Combatant Group in Jalalabad until 2001 was precisely a training facility where uh, individuals were instructed in the use of mobile phones in alarm function as detonators um, in, in um, simultaneous uh, explosions. Needless to say, neither Hassan al Haski nor Youssef Beldag are, by definition, individuals belonging to a local independent cell, 
self-radicalized and self-recruited wannabes. We also have um, other international, relevant international connections. I will not go into much detail on this, but to uh, allow me to, uh, to bring the case of Rabbi Osman al Sayyid Ahmed, Mohammed al Masri, Mohammed the Egyptian. Uh -huh. The evidence is not conclusive, but, but um, the report, the police report, um, pointing to his former membership of the Egyptian Islamic Jihad might, might be accurate because while in Italy he was in contact with former members of the same group and the Jamal al Islamiyah living in Italy and in Germany. Um, he did his military service in Egypt in a unit specialized in explosives and, and spent um, um, some years in prison at in, in, in his country of origin. He was arrested for the first time in 1999 in Germany, 1999. In September 2001, this, this surely is a coincidence, in September 2001, he, he left um, a center for uh, political and uh, asylum seekers and refugees um, arrived in Spain in 2002, uh, moved to France in February 2003, and then to Italy. Over those years, he was very active as a terrorist recruiter, mobilizing terrorist agent. The, um, actually, actually, it was the case of Murat uh, Chavarro in, 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 Bel in, in Belgium, who allowed the police uh, to, um, uh, to track. Um, we might consider him as uh, an Al-Qaeda recruiter. This is not conclusive. In the taped conversations, the Italians did something the Spaniards will, will, will I mean, it's legally it's possible, but it's unthinkable, um, taking into consideration our legal culture. That, that the Italians, when, 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 they, when the Spanish police noticed that one of the uh, Madrid Network individuals got a, a call from a phone in Milano, um, provided this information to the Italian police, and the Italian police did what they say that the Spanish police will never do. Uh, but don't, don't ask me the reasons, it's, uh, as I say, it has to do with the legal culture and the, and the Francoist authoritarian uh, past. Um, the Italian police placed in his house, in the house of Rabbi Osman in Milano, uh, video cameras and tape recording machines. Okay. And we have everything he say, uh, everything he did for months, for months. And obviously he was very active in saying um, uh, um, the, the, the answer to all this is to join Al-Qaeda and very active in recruiting people uh, for, the, for the purposes of becoming uh, suicide for joining Al-Qaeda in Iraq and so on and so forth. But perhaps you will also be surprised to know that this individual um, traveled, I mean, he, he knew people in Madrid, so he had his followers in the network. In the net, four of, uh, of the network members were um, direct followers of Rabbi Osman. And he, he was in Spain um, until uh, for a few days until January 2004. Probably the same as Josef Beldag. They traveled at the very last moment to check, to, to know, um, to make sure. When he went back to Italy, and precisely on February 4, 2004, he opened a an email account at a Yahoo server, and the FBI provided the Italian police uh, um, the information concerning that account. That account was open, that email account was open uh, introducing a false identity, 
a false name, a false address, and a false birthday. On February 4, 2004, Rabbi Osman opened a, an email account with a false identity and a false birthday, 11 March 1970. 11 March 1970. Don't ask me about why, the, why this fetishism uh, of uh, writing down the date, but this was a fact. This was a fact. And in this particular case, it was the FBI who provided the Italian authorities with the fact. So he knew about the date. He knew about the date. Other contacts, don't, as I said, I don't want to go into detail, but um, it makes more sense to refer to the Istanbul meeting in, in February 2002 if I say that Sahane Ben Abdel Majid Fahed had at least twice contact with two leading members of the Libyan Islamic Fighting Group. In one occasion, the receptor of the call was in London, and in the other occasion, he was in Hong Kong. Actually, he was arrested by the Chinese authorities and extradited to Morocco. Two protected witnesses um, confirm that Sarhane Ben Abdel Fayyid was in contact through email with another former member of the Abu Dada cell, who in 2001 um, moved into Afghanistan, um, whose name is Amer El Assisi, another well known individual. So, again, Rabbi Osman doesn't look like a member of an independent local cell. Of course, we, we do have ordinary delinquents in the, in, the, um, in, the, in the Madrid network. Between five and nine, depending on the criteria you will use to define those ordinary delinquents who were mobilized and became terrorist uh, uh, um, members. This sub set of people uh, previously into the drug dealing, uh, document forgery, robbery, and so on. This subset of people gathered around his, his leader in the criminal business, who became his leader in the terrorist activity, Jamal Amida, the Chinese, also one of the suiciders. Uh, suicides uh, of, of Leganes. Now, what is of tremendous interest, and I was personally surprised when I found this writing in the sentence, in the sentence, so there are so many facts uh, the judge considered not, not of no use for the purposes of applying our current probably deficitary criminal law uh, to this individual, but the judge um, in need of uh, explaining something, in the sentence reminds us that Jamal Amidan met for the first time Abu Dada. Uh, I still read many experts saying uh, Jamal Amidan re radicalized uh, when he was in prison in Morocco and so on. No, well, well, he he re radicalized them. He but. Jamal Amidan met for the first time Abu Dada in the Netherlands in the year 2000. Jamal Amidan was in the Netherlands for drug dealing affairs. Abu Dada was there for other reasons. But surprisingly, they talk about, they talk about Jamal Amidan, the Chinese, joining the Mujahideen in Chechnya. It's page 201 of the sentence. I, I'm not uh, mentioning the pages, but any one of you interested in particulars about this data, please, would be delighted to uh, reply to whatever request you might have. Many of those um, between five and nine individuals having previous criminal careers were born and raised in the 
northern Moroccan cities of Tetuan and Tangiers. And, and many of them knew each other from the days they lived in Tetuan and Tangiers. Uh, and if not, became close uh, afterwards. Um, this, this shows how effectively, how important affected ties based on neighborhood and family ties and kinship and friendship, how important all those elements were into assembling uh, the network as such. But before that, let me emphasize that even, even in the case of this subgroup of ordinary delinquents gathered around Jamal Amidad, uh, they became they became radicalized uh, from above, and they became recruited from above. It's not a case of self-radicalized and self-recruited individuals. Now, I said, uh, assembling the network, these affected types were, were important. Uh, a number of individuals uh, are, are, are linked to each other uh, by, uh, by neighborhood, uh, friendship, uh, kinship, and so on. Uh, this is extraordinary. Um, but this is the case in other tourist uh, groups and organizations. Uh, in, in, in ETA, for instance, in the Red Brigades, we know all these cases. But taking into consideration that individuals uh, came from different trajectories, were radicalized and recruited at different moments, some, some of them in the 90s, some of them before the Iraq war, these ordinary delinquents, um, those are the ones radicalized under the influence of the Iraq war. The Iraq war was used by the Tunisian, by other to radicalize them. Mm. In this, in this, th for this particular subgroup, the Iraq war was uh, a, a critical argument. So they, they belonged to different groups. They had different loyalties, uh, different motivations to prepare a major, a major attack in uh, Spain. So when it comes to the motivation for uh, 311, not all can be reduced to the war in Iraq. Actually, you know, the sentence says nothing about Iraq. Iraq is absent from the sentence. In the case of the former members of the Al-Qaeda cell in Spain, or in the case of Alekema Lamari, who was already a GI member in 1997, the war in Iraq might, might be adding something to what is already there. In that case, the, the wish, ac uh, and again according to the police reports, but it makes all that sense, the will to uh, perpetrate a major attack in Spain dates back to the end of 2001, early 2002. Why? Because the Al-Qaeda cell in Spain was dismantled in those days, so the individuals about whom the police was unable to provide enough incriminatory evidence to the judges were uh, um, infuriated to see their comrades and Abu Dada in jail. And, um, and for them, the main motivation was revenge, or the primary, I'm not saying exclusive, the primary motivation was revenge. What about Alekema Lamari? was already in the in the reports by the National Intelligence Center. He, his primary motivation was revenge. In the case of the Moroccan Islamic combatant group members, the will to perpetrate a major attack in Spain or in Morocco was based on strategic organizational decisions. And, ad and, and even more, adopted formally in February 2002. So 
when, when analyzing the Madrid bombings network, it is important, it is important not to confuse things and not, not to take the part for the whole. If we focus only on the subgroup uh, of, of former criminals led by Jama Amitan, the conclusions will be different and misleading than if we take into account at least the 27 individuals under my consideration. Um, this is a very personal comment. I don't find I don't find the ordinary the the former ordinary delinquents turned into terrorists sophisticated enough to decide that 311 was to take place exactly exactly 911 days after 911. Because I hope you know that 311 took place exactly 911 days after 911. Just go and count. 9-11 days <laughs> after 9-11. Mm. So in addition to, to individuals who already belonged to the Al-Qaeda cell in Spain in the 90s, in addition to individuals who uh, were members of the Moroccan Islamic combatant group and followers, and in addition to Rabbi Osman, so, 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 so what do I mean? Is this pointing to Al-Qaeda? Well, not necessarily. But nevertheless, let me have a look. If Al-Qaeda had any role on the 3-11 attacks, perhaps that was the role of an uh, instigator? Yeah, I will buy that. After all, we had we had um, Bin Laden appear a video, um, an audio recording by Bin Laden, um, broadcasted by Al Jazeera on October 18th, 2003, threatening uh, uh, some countries having troops deployed in Iraq, including Spain. Hey, wait a moment. I say October 18th, 2003. Now you have the answer. The first time the 311 date was ever, to our knowledge, written down in Brussels was on the day after, exactly, no one day before, two days later, the day after Osama bin Laden voice was broadcasted through Al Jazeera, naming Spain. Even more, on November 7th, 2003, Abu Mohammed Ablar said that an attack was to occur in one of the six countries, excluding the US, mentioned by the Emir in his October 18th message. But beyond ins instigation, do we have something beyond instigation? It's a slippery terrain now. Mm. But anyway, it seems to me very important the first communique claiming responsibility for the Madrid bombings. The very first communique claiming responsibility for the Madrid bombings. The first communique wasn't sent by the Madrid network. The first communique was sent by the Abu Hafs al-Masri brigades slash al-Qaeda, as it uh, as it is signed, to al-Quds al-Arabi on the very same day. And uh, of no, uh, I know uh, the, the many things that the Buhaf Samari say over the past years, um, which were untrue. But but it, it is interesting that Abdel Bari Atwan, in his in his book The Secret Story of Al Qaeda, uh, referring to this day, uh, he says at the time Al Qaeda was in the habit 
at, at the time. S he means his, since 1996. Huh? But anyway, he says at the time. At the time, Al Qaeda was in the habit in the habit of sending emails to our, our newspaper, claiming responsibility for attacks. Um, um, he refers to the uh, uh, to the claims in, in the October 2002, November 2003, and so on. And writes, I was therefore expecting to hear from Al Qaeda on 11th March. I asked my staff to monitor all communications very carefully. And in the early evening, I received a mysterious telephone call from someone in the Gulf, informing me that I should look for a special email at 7.30 p.m. I never ask him what he, uh, what can I understand by a mysterious telephone call, but anyway, I should look for a special email at 7.30 p.m. On the dot, an email arrived and I could see immediately that it was a genuine Al-Qaeda's communique. This was clear from the rhetorical style and the way the information was framed. He claimed respons responsibility for the Mali bombings and was signed by the Abu Habs and Marie Brigade and Kaida. Um, so I, I cannot confirm about that communique, but, but, but if, there is some, if, if there is someone in the world who is used to receive Al Qaeda's communique since, the, since 1996, he is uh, Abdel Bari Atwan, hmm? the person who validated this uh, communique. The first communique by, by the, by the uh, Madrid network um, appeared two days later, two days later. But what makes the more credible uh, the, the, the Al-Quds al Arabi communique is that on March, 15th, again, Abu Hab al Masri Brigades slash Al Qaeda sent a communique to Al Quds al Arabi again and Al Hajat this time, offering a truce to Spain. Offering a truce to Spain. That was March 15th. The elections in Spain were March 14th. So the communique was sent immediately after the results were known, uh, offering a truce. And see how interesting it is that on, on April the 3rd, hours before the police surrounded the, the flat in Leganes, hours before, the Madrid network members sent a fax announcing the, the end of the truce, but the Madrid Network members never announced a truce. So they, they were following al Abu Hafs al Mari messages, communiques. So the, the police needed here a proof that they were doing so, and the proof came. When the police was finally able to recover the content of those um, computers uh, left behind by the network, it was found that on the very same day that Al Abu Hafs al Masri um, communique um, was not only sent to Al Qusar Arabi, but before, just before that, the communique was placed was posted on the GIMSC website. That very same day, Jamal Amida unloaded the communique and saved it in the computer. The strategy. Of course, we all know that uh, Osama bin Laden and Ayman Sawati had been endorsing the Madrid bombings um, one way or the other. Uh, maybe, maybe some of you are curious why I'm not, I'm not paying much attention to the, to the, the so-called document of the Norwegians. 
Uh, surely some of you are asking this question now. Because I think it's completely irrelevant in the case of the 311 bombings. The, the document was written in September 2003, posted in December 2003, and, and, and the network was already preparing the attacks as from August 2003. So if interesting, maybe, maybe to legitimize what was going on, then um, as a causal factor to take into consideration in this particular case. Besides, the document was never found in the computers, in none of the computers. And the document refers to eventually attacking Spanish troops in Iraq. It was only a second communique late in December saying that we might attack Spanish troops in or outside Iraq, generic terms. So to conclude, my concluding remarks, um, we'll I certainly, I, I certainly will not say that the Madrid bombings were a series of terrorist attacks simply attributable to an independent local cell at work. Nor I will say that those involved in the planning and execution of the attacks conform to the profile of self-recruited leaderless jihad um, wannabes. In my opinion, the facts suggest a more complex reality, and this is what might be of particular interest moving up. A reality that corresponds not so much to an idea of global terrorism as an amorphous phenomenon, but to the idea of global terrorism as a polymorphous phenomenon. We have Al-Qaeda, we have Al-Qaeda's territorial extensions, we, we have Al-Qaeda's affiliated groups and organizations. We have, yes, local independent cells, but the vast majority of attacks are not coming from them, nor the, nor, nor the majority of, of foiled plots or current threats, nor even in Europe. In the Madrid bombings, we have individuals belonging to different components of this polyform phenomenon. Combine, yes, ad hoc uh, under particular circumstances. Fr from, from simply by looking at the Spanish case, it won't, but this is, the, the, I, 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 I extend this to a broad European view. When thinking about, for instance, the Barcelona January 2000 foiled suicide plot linked to the tribal areas of Pakistan and in particular to Tariq -e Taliban, Pakistan. We might even think about the Sauerland cell linked to the Islamic Jihad Union and Al-Qaeda itself. So when we think about the, the Barcelona plot nearly three years after the Madrid bombings, when we think about the, 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 the current elevated threat um, coming from Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb and, and associated or linked uh, individuals and cells in Spain and Italy and other European countries. The Madrid bombings appear increasingly as an example of global terrorism attacks taking place during a transitional period between the loss of the Afghan sanctuary and the current situation. And more concretely, and the Madrid bombings, I wasn't going to say this, but um, or to include this uh, as, a, as a very, very last point, but I decided to do so. Um, if only to keep the copyright. Mm -hmm. no. The Madrid bombings took place at the time when, uh, when Hamza Arabia Hamza al Rabija was the head of Al Qaeda's external operations. He replaced Khalidje Mohammed in, in uh, following his arrest in 2003 in Rawalpindi. 
Now, they, they, they had different styles. Kalisha e. Mohammed um, used to uh, recruit, train, and dispatch uh, operatives. Hamza Rabia wasn't in that fashion. Hamza Rabia liked it much more the idea of uh, relying on individuals and cells already present in the scenario where an attack might eventually perpetrate it. Um, however, no connection was found between Hamza Rabia and individuals directly or indirectly related to um, the Madrid bombings, or at least no connection whatsoever at the time I committed to this lecture with um, Robert and Bruce. Because last December, two Al-Qaeda individuals were convicted in Manchester. Remember this case in Manchester? One of them was a prominent individual, a member of an uh, international operational cell. The other one was kind of his assistant. But but the, they tried to hide uh, a 2005 diary where wrote in invisible ink details of a few top Al-Qaeda operatives. Um, this is only press reports. I still have to get the, 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 the sentence or to travel to Manchester uh, to read the whole information. So I, I, I'm using only press reports in this particular case. Now, the list of individuals is not very uh, is not very long, but includes two names: Hamza Rabia and Mamun Darkan Saleh. For those of you familiar with him, he is Ilias the Spanish, a past close associate of Abu Dada. The Spanish government asked uh, for the uh, uh, for the extradition of this individual um, to Germany in 2004. The extradition was accepted, was granted initially, and then because of a problem with the with the um, implementation of the Euro order to the constitutional system in Germany, uh, the extradition was cancelled. Uh, to my knowledge, mm, this individual is missing, but he was a close financier uh, attached to um, uh, Abu Dada and the Al-Qaeda Spanish cell, and taking into consideration how, how much uh, that what remained of that cell, and not exactly what remained of that cell, huh? because the Sarhane Ben Adel um, uh, uh, before the Madrid bombings was was in very close contact with um, with family members of Abu Dada. Hmm? That might be uh, an in interesting um, issue to to look uh, in deeper. Uh, but as I say, this is this is already I'm already into the area of the speculation, and I think I shall avoid this terrain. Um, and, 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 and simply thank you very much for your attention. And as I say, I will be very very happy to to get whatever comments you may have and and, and questions on on this particular issue. Thank you. Thank you very much. You know, one thing in listening to this very informed and detailed uh, exegesis of the Madrid bombing are the parallels with the cases in the United Kingdom. <coughs> because even to this day, people both in the United Kingdom and this country don't think that there is any connection between the individual cells that were active between 2004 and 2006 or that there was an Al-Qaeda role. But much like you've depicted, we now know that the Operation Crevice in 2004, the July 7th, 2005, plotters, uh, the July 21st, 2005 attempt, 
and the August 2006 airline parties, all trained at the same Al Qaeda camp mm -hmm. in uh, Pakistan, and all had these same sorts of uh, connections. So it's fascinating. This is a uh, pattern. But anyway, I'm sure there are a lot of questions. So please identify yourself and your affiliation. Uh, yes, sir. I think we have microphones coming. I'm Jerry Olick, intelligence analyst. Uh, Bruce introduced you and he said you published some material that wasn't acted on. A couple of weeks ago we had a CIA expert here and the same introduction. She published an uh, intelligence report that wasn't properly act acted upon or could have been acted on better. And my question to her was what could you have done better to, to get people to act on it? But my question to you today is based on your expert knowledge, is there anything that you see that governments or media or individual uh, organizations are not looking at uh, carefully enough in, in a general sense that could, pre, could, could be a prediction of things to come as far as terrorism is concerned since you have such an excellent record in this area? Well, it took me more than um, four or five hours to write that famous sentence in which I had to conclude that Spain was going to be the site of a major attack, uh, Al-Qaeda related. It was, it was at the end of 2002, but it was evident. And you know, my, my, uh, I concluded that not because of the Iraq war, because I was following the evolution of the Al-Qaeda Abu Dhabi cell. <coughs> um, uh, in, in I should go into detail now, but uh, at least in Spain and Europe, the trends, trends would be, um, uh, or the area to look uh, at uh, would be precisely those I, I, I mentioned. Uh, when I, uh, I was focusing on Spain just to, 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 to facilitate the understanding, but if you, if you look at what happened in Barcelona, and if you look at the, the, the cells dismantled over the past two years in Spain, we have the, the, here, we, here we, we have the two main focus. In one case, um, a, a well-organized group um, trying to perpetrate an act um, in the name of or in accordance with Al-Qaeda's leadership um, and mobilizing local cells for purposes for, for logistical or, or essential purposes. And on the other, on the other hand, we have the, the other main focus, um, um, Northern Africa, uh, because of Al Qaeda and Islamic Maghreb, in the land of Islamic Maghreb. In none of those cases, we are facing. or at least we are in none of those cases, we are primarily facing a threat coming from independent local cells. In those cases, we are facing a threat involving well-organized groups, be terrorist -e Taliban Pakistan or, or Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb. And, and you see in... Um, in Spain, uh, a friend of mine, uh, some of you might, might know him very well, uh, Javier Jordan, a, a professor at the University of Granada who also works on these issues, um, reminded me the other day that since 2004 in Spain, all the cells dismantled but one had linkages to a major organized jihadist terrorist group, in all but one case. And I'm counting with two digits, the number of cells. And the first digit is not one. So this, this, this would be, um, it, it, is already, it is already a success that we didn't have um, another attack in Spain. Because important plots were for it, not only in Barcelona, but in Madrid, in, in Ceuta in the northern uh, Spanish enclave in northern uh, Africa. Um, uh, and I find interesting similarities 
between, for instance, Barcelona 2007 and Germany 2007. And this is always this idea, that the Al-Qaeda might not be what it was before 2002. Uh, but, 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 but what is, all this, all this uh, body below Al-Qaeda is much larger. And, and, and there we have groups such as Tariq Talima Pakistan or Islamic Jihad Union, just to mention two um, based in Pakistan, we are um, an important source of travel. In the case of Spain, this is the Pakistani issue is relevant because in Catalonia we have the second largest Pakistani community uh, in Europe uh, and the first uh, in continental Europe um, and all living in the same place. 50,000, nearly 50,000 individuals. So it's, it's a, a case is very similar to the UK. Uh, Don Wolfensberger. Yeah, Don Wolfensberg with the Wilson Center. Do we have any evidence that Al Qaeda or other uh, radical Islamist groups are as fixated with numerology as your findings seem to imply? Um, I was interest fascinated, for instance, that you said that. Uh, 311 took place 911 days after 9/11, and yet, don't the Arabs uh, turn things around and, and put the uh, you know the day first and the month second, and so that that would kind of break down if you looked at 11/9 and and 11/3. Yeah, the 9/11 days is according to the Christian calendar, obviously, but uh, it's still shocking. I, I don't have a. Uh, an answer for that, but, but, but you can prove uh, that this is the case. And exactly 9-11 days. Actually, the first, because uh, the first or the second communique of the Abu Hafs al Marzi Brigade, they say exactly two years and a half. And that's, wh and, and, and that's when we decided to count. Why do they say exactly two years and a half? And we found out that it was 9-11 days after 9-11, according to our Christian calendar. I really don't have grounds enough to go beyond this. Um, and it, it is really surprising the, 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 the fetishism exhibited by uh, Yusef el and, and Rabbi Osman with respect to the, to the date. Um, um, I, I really don't know. I, I have been asking Islamic scholars and, and, and Islamists, uh, I, I, I don't have an answer yet. Uh, um, but what seems, what seems um, personable is to, or at least, at least this idea of going to, in the first case, uh, the, the when the date was written down in uh, October 19, 2003, it says 11 March 1921. You said Beldag is now 50 or 50 something, um, if I remember correctly. Uh, I was surprised when I went to the Shura 21 of the Quran and found this about the infidels trying to put away fire from their faces and, and backs. But true is I cannot follow the same argument uh, for uh, 85 or 70. You will always find something, but it's, it's not clear to me. So I really, uh, in terms of numerology, I, I, I will be happy if someone can help me in, in, in understanding better well, I'll tell you one thing. Um, the number four figures prominently, of course. Yeah, there were four that, attacks, yeah, uh, 1998 embassies, four, four planes trains. hijacked, four trains, four trains on 7-7. And of course, in Islamic numerology, the number four is the symbol of justice yeah. and retribution. Maybe co closer to a couple questions. Yeah, yeah actually, because we're running out of time. Sebastian, then we'll come to the side of the room. Uh, I and I'm going to collect questions, OK? Last Pre question, Sebastian. Thank you, Fernando, for a wonderful Sebastian Gorka, NDU. Thank you, Fernando, for a wonderful uh, forensic presentation that, that clearly puts you in the uh, Hoffman camp and not the Sagerman camp when it comes to leaderless jihad. 
Um, I'd just like to pick up on one thing you said. You, you said clearly the events you've discussed are representing of a phase, a phase between the loss of a Afghanistan and the current state of affairs. But you didn't tell us what that current state of affairs is. Could you describe where we are now, what that means, that phrase, state of affairs today? Can I just sharpen that and maybe even ask Bruce if he'd want to come? Because you had this sort of, on the one hand, bunch of guys, and then the other end of the spectrum, you've got Al Qaeda Central really operationally controlling everything, and the polymorphous model seems to fall somewhat in between th those uh, those uh, uh, poles, where you have some degree of autonomy, but also inspiration and some top down. Maybe. Maybe that's not characterizing correctly, but I'd be interested in, in this current state of affairs, uh, um, hearing what you say. Maybe even Bruce would want to. Actually, um, I think that Bruce is in a better position than me to uh, answer to this question. Um, by the way, I, I, I was already on his side. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's not that I came here to make merits uh, for that. <laughs> um, no, but. Um, mm, I have a, a better knowledge of, of, um, of things in Spain and Europe, um, even though I try to make an effort to go beyond the local, uh, and, and, uh, analytically speaking. And, and certainly, certainly, um, immediately after uh, the the uh, the loss of Afghanistan, what we have is um, uh, uh, is uh, a lot of people trying to find. Uh, a new place to stay, to rebuild, to reconstitute. Uh, they meet in Istanbul to see what what can we do, what shall we do. Um, uh, 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 Rowan and, 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 and Nielsen explain, explain uh, all this very, very well in his uh, uh, article. Um, and what we have now is, you see, uh, the, 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 the Pakistani Taliban are better organized. Um, uh, they have this super organization uh, providing protection and coverage to uh, other groups. Or, or, and we have in Northern Africa, we, ha we can no longer speculate with the idea that things outside Algeria are simply um, um, uh, how can I say, um, disorganized and uh, networks. No, what we have there is Al Qaeda and the Islamic Maghreb. So, so it's uh, in between uh, 2002 um, uh, uh, and now, where mm, it is evident that a number of actors in in, in 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 the global network of terror are are reconstituted, reorganized, uh, uh, and I say even uh, even though Al Qaeda is uh, smaller and. and, and, and Relax the capabilities that, uh, that they had before. Uh, all this uh, amount of groups um, constituting an evolving segment are increasingly uh, well organized and increasingly uh, um, able to uh, operate. And uh, it comes to my mind the case of Al Qaeda and Islamic Maghreb. I know the the. They are not having the success they, they expected initially, uh, but it is uh, it is also evident that they, they became strongly influential, and they are accumulating a vast amount of money. By the way, uh, coming from in many cases the West, mm -hmm. uh, and um, so. It wasn't a good idea to make such a strong emphasis, in my opinion, on on this uh, spontaneous, uh, homegrown, uh, uh, disorganized, horizontal phenomenon. Because what I see in Spain, what I see in France, what I see in Italy, what I see now in, uh, in, in Germany, which I have to mention here, my, my colleague Guido Steinberg, who, who helping me to better understand uh, uh, things there, does not correspond to that idea. And it was, 
it was surprising to me to see intelligence agencies in Europe aim buying this idea uncritically. It was very surprising to me. Uh, and uh, n now, now, now they, they change, huh? They all change, huh? Or oh, most all. Most all. Okay. I'll just say one thing, and then we'll collect the, le the remaining questions. At least from my perspective, I never argued that it was just top down. I mean, this was something of a, a caricature that some people drew. It was always, I think, exactly as Fernando described it, both bottoms up and top down, both independence and, um, and, 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 and mixed together. I think it's unfortunate, though, just as Fernando just said, is that some people have this certainty about terrorism that they can draw an either or distinction. Um, it's much more opaque, but what was clear is that terrorists are the consummate opportunists, especially Al-Qaeda, and they take advantage of opportunities that present themselves both in terms of radicalized individuals that they can bring into their organization. But I think the point is, is that as Fernando's cases, and this is almost all <coughs> they depict, uh, for the most consequential and significant terrorist acts, um, there's always an organization involved. Mm -hmm. And I'll put a brief plug uh, to prove this. Fernando and I are co-editing a volume that Columbia University Press will publish that has 20 different authors from almost as many different countries that are looking throughout the world at this entire phenomena and attempting to discern precisely which incidents are leaderless, as it were, that don't have an organization and which are organizationally driven. Okay, why don't we collect all four of these questions very quickly, because we have to vacate this room uh, uh, shortly. So we'll start with the gentleman in the back and then Javier and then end here. So if you could be very brief with your questions. Sure. I'm uh, Dan Fowler from Congressional Quarterly, and um, I just wanted to know, what are some of the lessons Spain has learned and the actions it has taken in, in response to the 2004 attacks that you would recommend the U.S. take to prevent a similar attack on rail or subway systems? And over here. Javier? Oh, well, actually, the fellow with the glasses, and then, and then we'll go, and then Javier. Thank you. Um, it's along the same lines as what's already been discussed to some extent, but if you think about these as being overlapping circles, then couldn't you, e if you take your evidence, which one can read as circumstantial evidence for these connections, then couldn't you also equally say, well, people operate in similar circles, these are relatively small groups, they know each other, uh, Al-Qaeda in Islamic Maghreb is not as far as I can tell, not really Al-Qaeda. They're really very Algeria-focused. Uh, does that really prove any kind of broader Al-Qaeda link, right? If one were to argue against your position, the implied position, uh, and that these, these are, in fact, local groups that, that claim the Al-Qaeda sort of moniker, the, the title, and that it benefits everybody to be Al-Qaeda, right? It makes them more glorious, and it, uh, and it makes Al-Qaeda uh, also more glorious if everybody has a, a, an incentive to claim the Al-Qaeda connection. So if you could just respond to those, thanks. Javier and the two gentlemen up here. I'm Javier, a Georgetown University student. Um, I have a question regarding how to counter this threat because uh, we saw in March 11 attack that most of the terrorists were monitored by the police or uh, counter-terrorist Spanish agencies, but they were not detained because the lack of uh, evidences of, I mean, but now we have the, 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 the other problem, that most of the cells detained in Spain, I mean, it's clear that, or academically clear, that they were about to, to plan attacks, but they can't be uh, convinced or they can't be put in jail because the lack of clear evidence or evidences or because they don't have the, the explosives, whatever it happened with the cell in Barcelona, it happened with the cell that was about to attack the Audiencia Nacional and the at, um, as an stadium in Madrid. I mean, it was clear that they were going to attack, but they don't have explosives, so they are now in the street. So how, when do you think it's better to, I mean, to uh, detain or to counter this threat? At what point? And then, yes, you, and then the white shirt, sir. You'll be have the last question. Gustavo Alegret, I'm a journalist. Uh, I'm working as a consultant and as a uh, Washington correspondent for a Catalan radio station. Um, did you find in your investigation or in your academy research uh, the links between that cell and the, that attack and uh, the terrorist group in the north of Spain, ETA? Um, I think it's important to say uh, that the, the 48 hours be after the, the terrorist attack, 
that was the political statement from the government. And also, uh, just one example, the president of the government in that moment was calling all, all at least the main directors of the newspapers in Spain, just to stress this point. But um, after the election, um, I think nobody say anything else about this. Thank you. Sir, thank you for your patience there. Oh, no, that's fine. Uh, Frank Fletcher, independent researcher. Um, my question is, when was the very first presence that we know of of Al-Qaeda in Spain, and what is the ultimate goal? What is the ideology behind it? I've heard Islamic scholars and others say, well, any land that was once Islamic, how important is Spain in, in the ideology of Al-Qaeda, and what do they want to accomplish ultimately? Well, thank you very much. Um, I shift uh, position. Yeah, 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 sure. Yeah, you can answer whatever well, you wish. First of all, with respect to the to the uh, ETA issue, uh, yeah, as, as surprising as it might be, we still have around 20% of people in Spain convinced that the ETA is one way or the other behind the attacks. Um, no evidence whatsoever. No evidence whatsoever on that matter. Uh, and yes, you are right um, on President Aznar's uh, move with respect to the editors of the uh, major national newspapers. I can confirm that to you because I was in, Ma in Miami when the Madrid bombings took place. And, and as, as soon as I, uh, as I saw what happened, uh, um, Knowing, knowing ETA and knowing um, modestly, knowing the other phenomena as well, uh, I, I wrote an article for the paper I contribute most regularly in the país. Um, and the article, the title was Anatomy of, a, of an Islamist Attack. I sent the article. I was called immediately by the deputy, one of the deputy directors. I said, well, Fernando, you are, we are not going to publish your article. I say, the well, article was simply a comparison between that particular incident, with the four and so on, everything was included, uh, with all the cases, uh, and it's trying to, trying to support the idea that that was uh, a, an international terrorism event. And he got me to say that uh, you are, this time you are not right because the president of the government has called our editor personally to confirm that it was set up behind. So I have first-hand uh, experience with a particular issue. Um, the, the, the lessons, well, uh, well my, 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 my two years in the Ministry of Interior were precisely the vote to, to to draw lessons and, 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 and act accordingly or, 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 or try to intervene into that. Uh, the first lesson, the, uh, well, obviously, the threat from international terrorism was uh, underestimated, underestimated, despite the Casablanca attacks also against a Spanish target, uh, despite, uh, despite threats. And so. Understandably so to the extent that ETA um, was and still is a major terrorist problem in the country, although it is, it is now weaker, weaker than ever before. Uh, but having said so, the, the Madrid bombings were a major intelligence failure. First of all, a major intelligence failure. Only a handful of policemen were into the issue of international terrorism. Between 2001 and 2004, um, the number of police officers who uh, were moved to uh, increase uh, capabilities in police intelligence with respect to international terrorism can be counted with the fingers of just one hand. Lacking resources, lacking translators, lacking uh, 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 material devices, lacking cars, lacking everything. Now, we have uh, uh, nearly 10 times more policemen in the area. So the first lesson was, lesson, we have to increase intelligence capabilities in, 
this in, in this area. And quantitatively and qualitatively, it's not only to have more people in that area, but also to train that people, to, to allow them to make crucial distinctions, to know about that world, uh, to, buy, um, uh, to know better about Muslim immigration, in, in immigrants in the country, Muslim communities, and so on. The, 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 the Madi bombings were a major, uh, a major failure in coordination between agencies. The Abu Dhabi cell was uh, still under the, uh, the focus of those handful policemen uh, uh, still trying to find evidence enough against Jamal Sugam, uh, uh, um, uh, Sarhani, and so on. But then we have the, 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 the civil guards um, following drug dealing. And Jamal Amida was in their focus. And then we have another other units of the civil guard following illegal trade with explosives. And those who provided the explosives were in their focus. So, but no, no, at no point the information um, was crossed. So the decision was adopted in May 2004, despite three decades of fight against Keita terrorism. The decision was adopted only in May 2004, um, uh, weeks after the Madrid bombings, to create the National Center for Counter-Terrorist Coordination. And also for the first time, the decision was adopted in Spain to make all police databases of joint, shared, and immediate access, which was not the case before. Um, in terms of the, the, the Madrid bombings were a failure also in terms of international cooperation. To fight ETA, Spain needs 95% friends. A bit, a bit Mexico, Belgium perhaps, times uh, Ireland. But well, with these people, uh, remember the Moroccan authorities were asking Spain to follow closely Jamal Sugan and Sarhane 13 days before the, the Madrid bombings. So we had to redesign completely. We had, we had no uh, security attaché, uh, police intelligence attaché in Islamabad, for instance, nor in Jakarta, despite the fact that the, the Abu Dhabi cell was, was uh, interacting closely with individuals in, in one place or in, uh, in Pakistan. Or so, and the major focus of cooperation in this sense is now Morocco and Algeria. Not, not easy to do because uh, Morocco and Algeria are at odds with the, uh, the Sahara problem is, is, uh, is present here. Um, the cooperation with the, with the United States, by the way, was good over the past legislature, despite the distance between Zapatero and George Bush. It looks like um, police cooperation has an autonomy of, of itself. Uh, Anti-terrorist cooperation has an autonomy of, of itself. Uh, and, and that wor worked uh, along quite well, quite well. Mm. Um, Spain made no change in the legislation after the Madrid bombings. And this has been a handicap. This has been a handicap. Our legislation is well developed, uh, but um, but it was elaborated thinking about ETA and, ETA, and ETA's phenomenology. Uh, uh, and many of those individuals who are now, um, fortunately for them, not convicted, um, mainly it's because we don't have the, the, the criminal type to apply whereas that criminal type exists in France, in Italy, in the UK, and so on. We are now introducing in Spain, we're debating the introduction um, of, the, uh, of the French Association des Malfaiteurs, which is astonishing that we don't, we don't have that. We have been, are, are, are been part of the lobby to, to adapt the legislation onto, onto a phenomenon which is, yes, it is terrorism, but this is a terrorism organizing differently, speaking different languages, 
um, uh, having a, a, a non-existing previously with data connection with the, with the world of, of, of ordinary delinquents and so on and so forth. Um, my, my point with the Madrid bombings is not Al-Qaeda is behind. Al-Qaeda directed this. My point is the Madrid bombings cannot be presented as an independent local satellite work. The, the Madrid bombings cannot be presented as uh, the perpetrators, okay, here we have an author saying, the perpetrators of the Madrid bombings are another example of the self-recruited leaderless jihad, an unlikely network of young immigrants who came together in half, half, half a hazard way. Um, Whose words are those? Are you reading? Of, uh, this is this is an article by oh. the next generation of terror by by, by Mark Sageman. Oh, okay. Uh, 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 never found any direct connection between the Madrid bombers and international Al Qaeda networks. I don't claim I found a connection, a direct connection with Al-Qaeda. But there are plenty of connections with international Al-Qaeda networks. So if, if, we, if we only take those former criminal delinquents and, 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 and that part is taken for the whole, then, then the picture is completely misleading. This is what I claim. Although I was surprised uh, to, to find unexpectedly in News like you know the, this, this uh, Ilias the Spanish in the same list as Hamza Rabia, which means that the person was um, connecting with both of them at the same time for whatever the reason. No? But, I, but I, that is still highly speculative. I, I, for the time being, I prefer to remain in the facts and the facts about the Madrid bombings. That this is this is not this is not uh, an attack coming from an independent local cell. No, this is a reflection of how amorphous the phenomenon is today. It's much more elaborated than that, much more. Um, and uh, Al-Qaeda in the Islamic market, yeah, well, uh, it is true that the main focus of their activities in terms of attacks remains Algeria. But they're becoming uh, influential. They're, they're recruiting Mauritanians, they're recruiting from Mali. Um, uh, we have the number of individuals arrested in Libya can be counted by hundreds over the past three years, every year. So, um, and, and I think they are being, at least uh, what I see in South Arabia, how can Islamic Baghdad is being successful in amalgamating, in assembling individuals who previously were, were left on their own? Um, I think I, I uh, Javier, we, um, with my comment on the lessons, I, I, I cannot answer partially your question. However, uh, in the Barcelona case, the, the full explosives were not found, but uh, but um, uh, but the explosives they were they were handling the preparation of the larger amount was found. And it, this is important. Fortunately, when one of the members left the bag into the garbage can, uh, um, a, 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 a member of the, the CNI, the, the National Center of Intelligence, was, uh, was um, uh, watching that. And that bag was recovered, and additional elements uh, later on in one of the flats. No? Um, we, But you are right that, um, that, that some people is not being convicted nowadays in Spain for reasons, a variety of reasons, the including ideological reasons. Do we still have judges in Spain who think that an, an individual recruited in Spain to perpetrate a suicide attack under the banner of Al-Qaeda in Iraq or Ansar al-Suna in Iraq um, um, should not be considered a case of terrorist recruitment. 
we, 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 we have this, still this going on. So this is why it is so important for academics. We, in, in El, at the Cano Royal Institute, we decided to, to, uh, to write reports counting attacks and um, uh, who, who was the target, who were the victims, so as to provide the prosecutor uh, information of, for, for instance, in the case of Afghanistan, um, well, 80% uh, uh, of the terrorist, terrorist attacks are against Afghan um, targets, and 80% of the victims, and, and, and the figures are not so different in the case of Iraq. Uh, that, uh, that helps then to, uh, to formalize the prosecution. Um, and, and finally, the police investigation with respect to Dabu Dada cell was formally, formally initiated in 1994. Formally initiated. Um, formally. That is when the judge in Spain, the, uh, you, 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 uh, you investigate um, uh, suspicious um, uh, moves and then you hand this over to the judge and then it is up to the judge to decide. The police can no longer autonomously investigate. This is also a handicap that we have. No? It has been the, the, the judge to order further investigation on that or the other aspect. So, uh, and the cell was by established by 1994. So then it was around 1992, uh, that 1993, that uh, began to be uh, uh, formally considered a cell. Uh, initially formed by individuals who came to Spain in the 80s, and mainly from Syria. The, 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 those, the founders of the, of the Al-Qaeda cell in Spain, Abu Musa al suri uh, uh, Yarkas, uh, and so on, were Syrians, like, like, like the financier, were Syrians, uh, who escaped persecution against the Muslim Brotherhood. They belonged to the radical wings of the Muslim Brotherhood in Syria. So they came to Spain, were offered uh, uh, asylum status or legal residence, uh, and they joined it with uh, GIA members to form the, the, the first uh, cell uh, that we know in the country. Now, uh, in, in the first community, in the, in the uh, Wuhaf Salmar Marri Al Qaeda communique, uh, following the 3 11 attacks, um, it is the first mention is not about Iraq. The first mention is we have this ongoing business with Spain since the times of Al Andalus. It was quite shocking. That, and then it comes Spain support to the persecution of Muslims across the world. And so on. But, that, but first, the persecution started the day, the day, um, uh, the day Al Andalus was lost. Now, nothing new about this. It is true that as from 2006, Ayman al Sawahiri. Uh, Bin Laden, but in particular, so he has been really, really has been insisting on this idea of, uh, of Al Andalus and, and asking Al Qaeda and Islamic Maghreb, for instance, to the, the, this famous message. Uh, uh, um, I urge you to step uh, um, as, as soon as possible with your 45 feet in the usurped Al Andalus. Uh, and by the way, we have a strategy here because one year later, they were unable to perpetrate an attack, so Ayman al he came with, a, with another statement saying, until the day you can do so, remember that you have the Spanish, um, uh, the, the brothers of Spain and France are, are there in your own land in, in Northern Africa. Uh, so, um, uh, Assam, Abdullah Assam, included Al-Andalus in the 80s. Uh, in the list he made of the territories where a jihad similar to that successful in Afghanistan uh, could also be applied. He, the, the first territory mentioned was Palestine, and the last in the list was Al-Andalus, if you remember that, uh, that writing. Uh, so it is being um, uh, an issue, certainly. So uh, for, uh, we Last, last summer, uh, an Al-Qaeda in the land of Islamic Maghreb related uh, cell, although the, the linkage wasn't yet there, um, and the contact was already established, but not the linkage, um, was named Fatah al-Andalus. So 
So it's, uh, this issue is, is thank you. Is going on. Well, we've been treated today to an extraordinarily rich presentation. I mean, rich empirically, going through the, the Madrid case so carefully, uh, building on the information that has come out through court proceedings uh, and uh, other academic sources that have, that have become uh, available. And the picture that's emerged is, is one uh, which we heard uh, uh, fleshing out the, the, the true sort of character of the, of the Madrid attack, which really, uh, I think, uh, Fernando Renar has demolished uh, c conventional wisdom, a misleading conventional wisdom about the attacks, and in so doing, uh, pointed to the larger phenomenon which Bruce Hoffman's written about, about the emerging nature of, of the jihadist threat in the post-9-11 period and this complex relationship between, that defies sort of a neat uh, kind of dichotomy. It, it's, it's this complex top-down and bottom-up phenomenon and uh, sessions such as this uh, serve a purpose of trying to elucidate this sort of complex reality and bring it to Washington. We're, we're delighted that uh, uh, Professor Renard has got on a plane, came all the way over to do this, and, and this session's run long, and just a testimony to the richness of the, of the, uh, uh, of, of the uh, analysis that he brings to address this very important but neglected case in America. So thank you again. Please join me in thanking Fernando Renard. <laughs>